<clears throat> Hello, welcome back. Um, so in the last lesson, uh, you learned a bit about uh, how astronomers got from the Earth-centered or geocentric model of the universe to a sun-centered or heliocentric model of the universe. Um, we're going to continue down that line uh, and in fact look at some observations uh, and theories that came, further came out of that. So the first thing is uh, we're going to talk a bit about Kepler's laws uh, and how this updates the um, idea of heliocentrism. So where we left off, uh, these geocentric models like you see on the left, Earth in the center, um, all the planets and the sun and the moon going around and the stars, um, doesn't account for retrograde motion of planets very well. You have to add these little loop-de-loops to, to make that make sense. Um, <clears throat> however, the heliocentric model, putting the sun at the center of, in this case, the universe, but we know now just the solar system, uh, makes that retrograde motion kind of an obvious natural um, phenomenon. So the heliocentric model uh, was a vast improvement on the geocentric model in terms of predicting now, right? So predicting with this model where the planets would be at any given time. However, more and more detailed observations were being made and they were still finding discrepancies uh, between what the heliocentric model of Copernicus calculated and what um, was actually was actually going. Um, so on the right is a, a drawing of Tycho Brahe, who is um, who was an observer, an astronomer who mapped very precise precise positions of the planets. With these very very precise um, measurements, now, uh, like I said, the the heliocentric model of Copernicus didn't quite match up and in his model all of the planets orbited the sun in perfect circles. Tycho Brahe's data went to another scientist uh, by the name of Johannes Kepler, although I will note the word scientist was not in use until 1833, but just roll with me. Uh, another astronomer um, by the name of Johannes Kepler and he took that data and formulated what we now call Kepler's three laws. So laws, um, these are uh, models, again, predictions, uh, conclusions about the natural world that in every case we've measured have turned out to be true. Um, and so these laws, uh, they don't explain why something's happening, but it is explaining how planets orbit the sun. So Kepler's first law. Uh, breaks the notion that planets orbit the sun in perfect circles, which really bothered him. Uh, he really wanted some like nice geometric shapes to be to be um, symmetric geometric shapes. Um, but what he discovered is that the planets move in elliptical orbits. So an ellipse is a particular shape, um, kind of like a stretched out circle, uh, and the sun is at one of the two foci or focuses of the ellipse. Um, this uh, dr drawing here shows a rather extreme example, far more extreme than the ellipses that we see for the planets in our solar system. They're really close to circular, which is why, you know, it wasn't figured out that they weren't circular until they had really, really good observations. So the ellipse um, or an elongated circle uh, has two measurements. Um, the uh, minor axis is the length across the smallest bit, and the major axis is the length across the largest bit. Um, the more eccentric is kind of the ellipse, the more flattened and squished it gets. Um, whereas an ellipse with no eccentricity is actually a circle. That's where the major axis equals the minor axis, which is just the diameter of a circle. We're going to be using a and B. A is the semi-major axis, so it's half the major axis, and semi-minor axis um, is B. But A is kind of the crucial one we're going to be using. So his first law figured out uh, that's the shape of the orbit that fits the data best. Kepler's second law 
because uh, you will often see it written the way I do at the top of the slide. The planet moves around its orbit. It sweeps out equal area and equal time, which is a terrible way of saying something. You could express it much more simply saying that a planet travels faster when it's closer to the sun uh, than it does when it's further from the sun. And it, there's a specific relationship that gives you these, these geometries. So each of these paths that are highlighted, if you draw a sort of triangular-ish shape between the sun and that path, those areas are equal. And the path of that curve, the piece of that curve, the time it takes to get across there is equal as well. So if you're on the left side, it takes you the same amount of time to go that little bit as it does for the big one on the right side, so therefore it must be going faster on the right side. It's definitely easier to think of it as faster when you're closer, for, uh, slower when you're further away. Kepler's third law took a lot more time for him to derive and discover, um, but what he discovered was a relationship uh, that worked for all the planets. Um, so the first law, uh, the second law, back up a sec, second law talks about the speeds of a single planet in its elliptical orbit. The third law talks about the speeds of the different planets with respect to each other. Basically, the bigger the orbit, the longer it takes to go around, and it's a specific relationship. So P is the period, that's how long it takes a planet to go around the sun. For us, that's 365.25 days-ish. Um, if you square that number, you get, in, in years specifically, using the unit years, you square that number, you're gonna get the um, A cubed, where A is the semi-major axis, also known as the average distance from the sun, in units of astronomical units, or AU. The AU is defined as the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. So the Earth, with one year, you plug a one in there, one squared, AU, one AU, one cubed is one, you get one equals one, and that's great. Um, so it's very specific to the, these units. But what you find is that um, planets that have smaller orbits have shorter periods. Planets have, that have bigger orbits have longer periods. And at first it's kind of like, well, duh, the path is longer. Um, so here's just kind of a, a, an example here showing uh, these different planets with different uh, elliptical orbits around some star, the, the red star, the red dot there. Um, and so there's that same relationship works for all of these planets. If you measure the semi-major axis and if you measure their period, you're gonna get um, that, that same relationship. What that tells you, that specific relationship, what that tells you um, is that planets are actually moving faster the closer they are to the sun. So uh, it's not just that the path is shorter and that's why the period is shorter. The velocity, the speed is actually faster. Um, so on this graph, on the x-axis, you have the size of the orbit. Um, and as the orbit gets bigger, you have the y-axis, the speed is dropping. So there's a very specific relationship between the speed uh, and the orbit. So for example, at 1 AU, where the Earth is, uh, the orbital speed's about 33 kilometers per second. So the planet you are sitting on right now is moving 33 kilometers, which is some number of miles I don't wanna calculate in my head. 20-ish, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> 33 kilometers every second. We don't feel that, obviously, but that's what's going on. Okay, so the highlights from this section uh, are that when you observe the motion of, uh, when the, the motions of the planets and the positions of the planets were observed very carefully, uh, it led to a, an adjustment of the model of the solar system that Copernicus had, um, had proposed, sun in the middle, planets in circular orbits. Um, Kepler used that data to determine that the planets orbit in ellipses and that they move faster when they're closer to the sun than when they're further away in their own orbit and that there's a specific relationship between the period and the average distance between planet and sun 
that tells you that planets that are further away also move more slowly than planets that are closer in. Okay. So uh, this was, you know, uh, the new model for the solar system. Uh, but again, I that explains how things move. It doesn't really talk about why things move. Um, this came a bit later on, um, as we're going to talk a bit about uh, Isaac Newton's work, uh, where he linked the motions of the planets, the motions of the heavens, to uh, the motion of things on the Earth. So gravity is the specific force that is causing the planets to orbit the sun. The same force that if I pick up a ball and drop it, causes the ball to drop to the ground. Um, for that, real quick, sorry, missed this. Uh, Galile I wanted to, to say a little bit about Galileo. Galileo is the first one to use a telescope to study the heavens and to publish it. Uh, he may not necessarily have been the first person to look at the sky through a telescope, but he's the first person to publish his results. Um, and his results helped back up the heliocentric model um, because of a couple things. One is that the Venus goes through phases. Um, and you can see a diagram showing the phases here. So Venus is a very, very bright object in the sky, either in the east around sunrise or the west around sunset. If you look at it through a telescope, depending on what time of year it is, you might be able to see its phase. When it's close up, it makes a crescent. <laughs> when it's closer to us in its orbit, it makes a crescent. When it's further away, uh, you know, you get a quarter, you get a gibbous, you get a full, just like the moon phases. Um, and this is explained by the heliocentric model. It doesn't work in the geocentric model of everything going around the Earth. So you have uh, that observation. Um, he also discovered that there were four little dots that were orbiting Jupiter. So Jupiter has its own moons, uh, which again shows that the Earth isn't the, can't be the center of all motion. Um, we know the Earth, we know the moon goes around the Earth, but Jupiter has its own moons. And so the four moons that he discovered are called the Galilean moons. He uh, did some other observations that challenged uh, beliefs at the time that the heavens was perfect and unchanging. He saw sunspots in the sun. He also used a telescope to look at the sun, which you should never, ever, 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 ever do. Please don't do that. <laughs> um, but also noticed that the moon uh, had craters and mountains and had a landscape, you know, not unlike some deserts on Earth, although it's not really like anything on Earth because um, it's dry even drier than deserts, um, and dusty. I distracted myself. Okay, so the moon uh, is not perfect. It, it is a, a world like the Earth. So you've got these connections now between Earth and the heavens, um, and Newton develops uh, laws of motion, um, or, or physics, basically, some the, the basics of, of motion in physics by looking at the motion of these planets, but also looking at how things um, fall on Earth. And he comes up with a description for motion and three laws of his own. Sorry, there's laws everywhere. First law is that an object moves at a constant speed or velocity unless a net force acts to change its speed or direction. So velocity is speed and direction information um, in, in one quantity. Um, a net force means there's more force pushing it from some direction. It's not all equal from all directions. This may seem obvious. It was not obvious considering that if I push a book across a table and, you know, don't give it a huge push, it'll slow down and stop. So the first inclination, you know, in inclination that people would think is, oh, everything moves, everything tends to, to move to rest. Everything tends to slow down and go to rest. Um, but that's because there was a force known as friction acting on that that was slowing it down. If I did that on a frictionless surface, say it was perfectly, the perfectly smoothest, smooth air hockey table in, in the whole universe with no friction whatsoever, it, it would keep it would keep moving forever. Um, if you've ever played air hockey, you know you can really get the puck bouncing back and forth a ton of times. 
um, because there's so little friction um, and air resistance. Not zero, but a little bit. So uh, Newton said you had to have an external force, and for most of the things in our everyday life, friction is that force. The second law of motion uh, talks about this force uh, and says that it's equal to the mass of an object times its acceleration. So acceleration is the rate of change of speed. The acceleration tells you how the speed is changing. So think of an on-ramp onto a highway if you're driving, um, your, speed, your speed is going up, right? So you're accelerating as you get onto the highway to match highway speeds. If you're coming down, you're decelerating, or sometimes we call that negative acceleration. Um, the f amount of force that you give to that object tells you how much acceleration it will get. Um, so if I, uh, so if I, you know, if I throw a baseball, I'm not going to give it much force. I'm not a major league p pitcher. I'm not even an amateur pitcher. If I give a baseball some force, uh, it's going to accelerate to some speed that is probably pathetic uh, on, on the scale of pitches. But if a major league uh, or even minor league pitcher, you know, some professional throws that same ball, same mass with a lot more force because they've practiced, um, it's going to accelerate much more than the one that I threw. So by the time it gets to the plate, it's going faster than mine was. Mine probably won't even make the plate, uh, let's be honest. <laughs> but if you gave that same pitcher a bowling ball and he was able to give it the same amount of force, um, it wouldn't accelerate as much. So all of these three things are related in Newton's second law. Newton's third law is that for every force, there is an equal and opposite reaction force, uh, which leads us to the conclusion that if you are standing on the earth, you are putting force on the earth, the earth is putting just as much force up on you because um, you're in a stable configuration. You're not flying up. You're not drilling down through the earth. Uh, the forces are equal in amount and opposite in their direction. Um, specifically related to the motion of the planets, Newton derived the law of gravity. So how strong the force of gravity is depends on several different factors. Um, first of all, you see Newton's third law here by the fact that the force that object one is pulling on two is the same as the force of object two pulling on one. Same amount of force on each other. Um, and that depends on the mass, how, it, how much matter, how much mass there is in each object, uh, and the distance between them, particularly the distance, it's over the distance squared. So say if you double the distance, the force is four times weaker. If you triple the distance, the force is three squared, nine times weaker. Um, so that tells you that every bit of matter attracts every other bit of matter. Every tiny bit of matter in the universe attracts every other tiny bit of matter in the universe. But gravity is not super strong as far as forces go. Um, it's directly proportional to those masses and it's inversely proportional to the distance squared. So, um, let me see if I want to, okay. Um, one way to think about this, so these masses on the screen look about the same. We're talking about a star, which is really, really huge, and a planet, which in, um, da, 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 in relation to that is really, really, really tiny. And I'm telling you that the force that the sun, say, exerts on the earth is the same that the earth exerts on the sun. Well, that seems weird, um, but it's not that weird when you look back at Newton's second law. That gravitational force is still subject to this relationship of the mass times the acceleration. So both objects have the same force on each other, but the one that has a little bit of mass is going to be really wildly accelerated. That's us, the planet. The one that has a whole lot of mass is going to have a teeny tiny acceleration. Um, a more uh, realistic, yes, a more realistic example of this, um, and my favorite one, is if you are um, driving and a bug smashes into your windshield, 
uh, the windshield puts the same amount of force on the bug that the bug puts on the windshield. Seems strange. But even though the forces are the same, the effect on each object is different. Because the car has a huge mass, its acceleration, its change of speed from hitting that bug is super tiny. For the bug, its change of speed from hitting that car is really large. It goes, and that's what makes it go splat, basically. Um, so that, uh, so we have Newton's law, um, the mass matters and the distance matters. And that takes us back to Kepler's third law, actually second and third law, where planets were moving slower the further away they were from the sun, which now makes quite a bit of sense because the further away you are, the larger that distance R, so the slower, the, the less the, the gravitational force, therefore the slower it's going to be moving um, to keep from, you know, hurtling into the sun. So highlights from that are that the force of gravity between two objects is opposite but equal. Uh, the force depends on the mass of the objects and the distance between them and the motion of objects in the solar system and the universe and the Earth, and everything else uh, is defined by these gravitational forces. And these gravitational forces tell us why planets orbit the way they orbit in the way that Kepler discovered. Uh, now, this section covers a, a few more topics um, that I don't get too much into in class, um, acceleration and escape velocity um, at this point. Acceleration, like I said, was uh, the rate of change of speed um, so it's how quickly that needle is going around, basically, right? So it's how um, your speed is changing from moment to moment. So that's your acceleration. It's very easy to get confused between acceleration and speed. Um, and you can calculate the acceleration if you have the force divided by the mass. Gravity, being a force, uh, can cause acceleration. So when you drop an object, um, from some height, that object is going to accelerate. I mean, it's going to go faster and faster and faster until it hits the ground. Now here on earth, we have this lovely thing called air resistance, uh, which will keep it from, you know, going faster forever. But if you're in an air, a place with no air, such as, Hey, the surface of the moon, uh, what you find is that all objects, no matter what their mass, will fall with the same acceleration. So uh, they, they showed this on one of the Apollo missions when an astronaut dropped a hammer and a feather on the surface of the moon from the same height and brrr, they hit the ground at the same time. That's not what we see on Earth because air resistance affects the feather more than it affects the hammer, um, but they went ahead and did that and showed that, oh, that's actually what happens. Now, if you give something a little bit of force or motion parallel to the surface, right? You're going to get this kind of arc. So you see in the second half, you see in the second half of that arc, arc there. The more force you give it, the further it's going to go. And you can take that uh, concept all the way to, so, you know, if you throw, you know, say uh, instead of throwing, you have a little cannonball going boop. Um, with a little bit of force, it goes to point A. With more force, it goes to point B. Eventually, you can give it enough force such that it actually orbits the Earth. It's moving so quickly at what um, at that would be at a circular velocity. It's moving so quickly that the Earth is falling away before it can reach the ground. Um, so you can put things into orbit that way. Um, and then uh, to escape it completely, you have to hit a certain escape velocity. Escape velocity depends on the mass and the radius of the object you're sitting on, right? So the size and the mass of the Earth determines what the escape velocity is for rockets that want to, say, leave the Earth. So again, highlighting that the same laws of physics that determine the motions of stars, planets, and galaxies determine the paths of falling objects on Earth and the motions of rockets, uh, which take us to space. That's it for this section, and I will see you again soon.